I'm Sean Marsley, and this is Exploring Work Wednesday, and thank you all for joining us. I'm excited to introduce our first, our first guest of the new school year, Craig Ferris, who is the manager of Smart Life Centers and Technology Programs for the CNIB Foundation. Welcome, Craig. Thanks for having me, Sean. Excited Thanks to be so here with all of you. Yeah. So... Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, your level of vision, eye condition, where you grew up, and of course your job. Sure, <clears throat> can do. Uh, I was born totally blind and my eye condition is genetic. There's no name, so there's no known cause or cure for it. The first we saw of it in our family was when my mom was born blind. And we didn't know it was hereditary until lo and behold, I was also born blind. And so I am the oldest of uh, six kids and three of us were born blind and three can see. So obviously it runs in our family. And that's really all I know. Um, medical doctors did some tests when I was uh, kindergarten or first grade and they determined that possibly our Blindness was due to a lack of pigment behind the eyes. Um, I do have light perception, but that is it. So they wrote us up in a bunch of uh, medical journals and basically told us there was nothing more they could do because it's such a rare condition. Wow. Um, I grew up on Protection Island, which is a little island off of Nanaimo on Vancouver Island, if any of you know the area. Protection is a very small community, only about 200 people. Uh, it's all dirt roads, maybe a mile and a half long and three quarters of a mile wide. Um, <clears throat> it was a really magical, fun place to grow up because it was close enough to the city that we could take a ferry over to town, we called it. Instead of a school bus, we took a school ferry. Um, everything was very water centered. And because it was so quiet, my brothers and sisters and I all did a ton of bike riding and camping. There was a neighboring island next to Protection, um, a provincial park called Newcastle Island. And we would either boat across or sometimes we would swim across. And on low tide, there wasn't much water between the two islands and you could actually slog through the mud to get from one to the other. So it was a really fun place to grow up. Um, and now for my work life, as Sean, as you said, I'm the manager of Smart Life Centers and Technology Programs uh, for Western Canada. Really, that just means I oversee our retail stores and our technology programs for BC and Alberta. Up until recently, I used to be the program lead for technology, and so I was uh, responsible for developing and teaching a lot of our technology curriculum, specifically related to assistive technology for people who are blind. Most of our clients in, in my program are older adults or seniors who have recently lost their vision. So that's kind of my little snapshot. So when did you start thinking about a career and what factors contributed to the career that you pursued? I know you've done many different things, so I'm really <laughs> interested to hear this story. <laughs> yeah, something that a lot of people, a, a word that a lot of folks use to describe me and my family is unique, unusual, bizarre, strange. Um, and I would have to agree with them. So my I was homeschooled past the first grade. And I'm really glad I was in a way because that sort of encouraged us to think creatively. So when I when my brother and I were about 14 and 15, we received a very unusual Christmas gift. It was an old motor home that we turned into a guest cottage on our property on the island. Well, you can imagine as a couple teenagers how thrilling it was to have your own little oasis away from the family. And so, man, did we maximize it. You know, we set it up so that we could, uh, we could cook there. And we started staying out there all summer long. It was awesome. But the problem was we needed funds to buy pots and pans for this little guest cottage. And so we started doing a lot of babysitting because I loved kids, still do. Um, my brother liked kids some too, but he was more into coding. And so 
we eventually figured out that we wanted to work for ourselves. And so we started a business in high school in ninth and 10th grade. Um, actually, we started two of them. One was the Braille Superstore and one was Marvel Soft Enterprises. And at the time, there sometimes when we would try to order uh, talking clocks or get braille materials most of it had to come from the states or it was really expensive to buy them in canada and so we thought well why not take advantage of this new thing called the internet this was back in the 90s when it was actually new and people still called it the world wide web <laughs> and um so we launched a website and we started to create new products uh for blind people and we started selling them on our website throughout Canada. But the funny thing was that most of our customers ended up coming from the States. And so only about 10% of our sales originated from Canada. Um, so the idea was we wanted to make these products more affordable for everyone. And we wanted to make them available in Canada and abroad. And we saw lots of opportunities to create new items that maybe weren't on the market or that we could improve upon it. So that's kind of how we got started in business. And, and uh, we did that for a long time. And then I'll get to the, the rest later, but I had another business and then I switched careers again. So yeah, I've done a few different random things. So, I mean, it's like you, you kind of started a career before you even started thinking about what kind of career you wanted, it sounds like. It's true. And we started doing this in high school. And at first, our mom and dad weren't too sure how it would go. Um, a really funny story is back in the 90s, uh, banks were pretty cautious. They still are, but it was much harder. And so we were 15 and 16, my brother and I, both blind. And we were too young to have a credit card. But we managed to convince the Royal Bank to give us what is called a merchant account so that we could charge other people's credit cards. And so they had, we had these two teenagers who were receiving customers' credit cards to be able to process sales. <laughs> Our whole story was just, we did everything out of order. Mm -hmm. um, we convinced our parents that if we could get the business to viability, in other words, making enough money to support ourselves before we graduated high school, that we could forego college. And yeah. when we finally got the go ahead for that, we worked like crazy people because we loved this business. We wanted it to succeed. And so we pulled a lot of all-nighters. And sure enough, by the time we finished uh, high school, it was viable, and so we were saving to buy a house. And so we took that path. It was very um, unusual, especially that back then. Wow. Okay, so how did you get from the business to the next phase then? Yeah, so it was a, it was a long journey. All through our 20s, we grew the business. Um, we each ended up buying a house in Abbotsford, so we were sort of self-taught in... Um, learning our business skills. We did a lot of research. I read many books. Um, Google wasn't a thing so much then. We used other search engines. We learned by trial and error. And for the benefit of anybody here, if you are interested in starting a business, it would have been helpful for us to take a few business courses, even if we didn't do the full degree program. It could have saved us a few costly mistakes for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do wish we'd done that, but we certainly managed without it. Um, once my brother and I parted ways on the business, I sold my shares and then I bought a, another business, a retail gift shop and a clothing store. And so I ran that for a few years, but I really missed working with uh, blind people. I, I realized that was my calling and I loved encouraging people and sort of smashing those stereotypes and encouraging people what was possible. And I loved when somebody would call up and say, I can't do this anymore because I've lost my vision. And I love being able to say, oh, but you can, you just need this little gadget and these skills, and you can just get back to doing what you were doing before using different techniques. And so that's when I decided to um, get certified in tech training. So I wanted to teach people assistive technology because I saw how this field was really blowing up. And so in 2017, I spent a year at the Louisiana Center for the Blind um, in the Southern US. 
where I got certified in rehabilitation teaching for the blind. And it was, I thought it was going to be a really easy program. I guess it was kind of arrogant of me because I was like, oh, I've done tech for 20 years. I've run this very successful online business. I know everything there is to know about tech. And so <laughs> the first week, I think my instructor just purposely made a point of showing me everything I didn't know so that I would be humbled and get back into the mode of a student. And so that's definitely what happened. Wow. <clears throat> and so um, there, I picked up a ton of blindness skills in the process because before I was able to teach technology, they wanted me to be a very competent uh, blind person. And so they taught uh, intensive. So this was like a, um, I had six months of steady instruction, eight hours a day. So two hours of O&M, two hours of industrial arts. And so these things like O&M, for example, to graduate, the last assignment was they would drop you somewhere in the city, a drop route. You would be blindfolded, of course. They would not tell you where you were. They'd, they'd take you in a car and spin donuts so that you would have no clue. They would drop you somewhere randomly. It could have been half a mile from the center. It could have been five miles across the train tracks. And I had to figure out where I was on my own without asking anybody and find my way back to the center. Um, same kind of thing with industrial arts. We had to learn to use all the major uh, power tools on our own. Uh, home management, they made us cook a meal for 40 people. Um, before we graduated that one. And then, of course, what I actually went there for, assistive technology, they uh, taught us extensively how to use the iPhone and Microsoft Office and all those good things. So I got my certification in rehab teaching, but it really was a lot more than that. I got a bunch of other blindness skills that I didn't know I needed, but I kind of did. So, so I would say, sorry, go ahead. Well, just, I mean, your mom was blind, you grew up blind, but you still felt like you learned things at the center. That's really interesting. I did. And you're right. My mom was, uh, is blind and she taught us kids a ton and I had traveled extensively, um, but I wasn't as smooth or as comfortable or as efficient as mm -hmm. I was after I went to the center. And so, you know, I would, I would take a lot of um, Ubers or taxis or buses instead of just walking it because I didn't know how to just guess and figure out the way. And so a lot of those soft skills were taught. And I guess I would also say I learned a lot of patience. I learned to submit to the process, even though some of the tasks when I first went there seemed ridiculous. I was like, okay, I'll just humor them. And then the longer I stayed, the more I was like, oh man, I really learned a lot here. And so I kind of learned to enjoy the journey. And because in my case, I'd already worked ever since uh, I was in high school, I was a bit impatient to be back to starving student mode. <laughs> but <laughs> all too soon, you know, once you get a job again, then you're a working professional and you have an income. And so all of that is rewarding too. What education do you need to do the job you have now? Um, and I guess, I mean, you've sort of talked about it. The, the question is what skills helped you get through the schooling? Did you need the certification from Louise, the Louisiana School for the Blind or did you, or center? Sorry, it's not, a, I don't know what it's called, but. Center, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So yes, the skills that I got from there were invaluable to my job here. The funny thing is when I started with CNIB, they didn't recognize my certification. Mm. And I was hired as an intern. And at first I was told that I couldn't teach assistive technology because I didn't have the certification that CNIB recognizes that focuses more on sighted people getting qualified for this job. Right. Um, so I was like, okay, I'll just kind of show them what I can do. And they quickly saw that I had learned uh, because of I was so fortunate to be able to go to the center, I had learned how to do things very efficiently and sighted colleagues would come to me asking for help on all kinds of things. And so after about a month and a half, uh, one of our tech trainers left and I was called into my boss's office and they said, hey, we need you to start teaching clients. And I was like, I thought I couldn't do that. And they're like, uh, yeah, you can now. So there's... I think in, in our world, there's a huge shortage of assistive technology trainers. Um, I just was hiring for a position and it was super hard to fill it. 
Mm. So if someone has really good tech skills on the iPhone and Windows computers, especially, and you're good at problem solving, you'll have work. If you have um, a degree in, you know, information technology or a certification like the one I got in Louisiana, it shows that you're well-rounded. There are other avenues to get those skills as well. Um, but yeah, it's a really good career field and it's, it's very much in demand. They told me when I graduated from LCB that for every graduate, there's four open positions. And as an example, you know, I, just for fun, I applied for four or five different positions in different states. And not because I'm especially good, just because there's so shortage, I got, I got job offers for all of them. And then I was able to pick and say, no, I don't want to move to somewhere really cold or somewhere really expensive. So it's, it's a promising field, and it is the same here in Canada. I love what you said about, you know, initially when you got the job, you didn't have the certification they were looking for. And like some people would have, could have gotten kind of, I don't know, uppity about that. Right. And said, well, screw you. (laughs) (laughs) And it sounds like you just, you accepted what they said and you, you just like put in the time and proved what you could do and it paid off. Right. Yes. And I guess that's, and I'll get to it later on with one of your other questions, but that's where having the confidence and the confidence comes into play because instead of just trying to butt heads with them and say, Hey, no, I I do have all these skills. Um, A lot of your specialists, you know, don't know some of the things that I think they should. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to prove that I could. And so I tried to really work hard for the time I was there. I, I always am a bit of an overachiever, I guess. And so, you know, your work speaks for itself. And my dad always used to tell us growing up, actions speak louder than words. So instead of, you know, talking about what you can do, just go do it and do it better than, you know, do it your very, very best. And people will notice. What skills helped you get through the schooling? I guess that was when I was referring, maybe I jumped ahead. You know, I was talking about being patient, um, submitting to the process. So just not trying to pretend I knew it all because a lot of the things I thought I knew and they had to knock me down a peg or two to say, no, actually you need to learn this and this. You know, when I first came, I had an older Windows computer and I had to upgrade it to a new one. I had been using NVDA and they insisted I learned JAWS. Um, And so I had when I was in school, I had to realize, okay, I'm here to learn. And I was on scholarship. I had paid a bunch of money myself. And so I resolved to make the most of my time there and just soak up the information like a sponge and make that my entire goal for that year. That for me was really helpful because once I got into that mode, that was my sole focus. I wanted to do the very best job I possibly could. Um, And then I just had to make myself relax some and enjoy the journey of being in school because I had worked uh, for so many years before I was in school. You know, I went back to school when I was like 34 or 35. Like I said, I did everything out of order. It was really strange. (laughs) Um, And at the center, we had kids from 18 all the way up to 65. It was very cool because age didn't matter. What country you were from didn't matter. Your skin color didn't matter. Nobody cared about any of it. All that mattered is that we had one common thing uniting us, and that was our vision loss. And we had we all had one common goal to succeed in life and learning all these skills. And so we had the most random combinations of, you know, old people teaching young people, young people teaching older people. It was very cool. Hmm, that's awesome. What accommodations do you need at your job and how did you go about ensuring that you would have those accommodations. Um, I feel like with CNIB, it's a little bit uh, maybe (laughs) easier than with other places, but I am curious about, you know, if you have to teach people who are low vision technology and you're a JAWS user, how, you know, how does that work? That's a good point, Sean. So you're right. For the first part of your question uh, here at CNIB, all I had to do was uh, fill out the accommodations form that they supplied when I was hired. And so I was provided with a Windows 10 computer with JAWS and an iPhone, which of course I can use voiceover on. Um, 
most of our systems are very accessible. So that really wasn't an issue at all. Um, not surprisingly, CNIB is pretty darn good about accessibility. When it comes to teaching people with low vision, that was one of my chief concerns, actually, because the program I took in Louisiana was focused almost exclusively on non-visual skills because a lot of people, and I don't want to make a blanket statement, but if, if people are using magnification greater than three or four X, they're probably not going to be efficient enough to read a large amount of information in school or the workplace. And so they encouraged folks, if they were using really high powered magnification to switch to a screen reader, at least some of the time. But so I didn't learn how to teach magnification in Louisiana. I had to learn that here. And so that's one thing I learned from my colleagues. And so I did uh, go and explore Windows Magnifier and Zoom Text and Zoom on the iPhone so that I can actually now talk half intelligently about the different magnification features, even though I can't see anything. I'm as blind as a bat, but it actually does work to talk somebody through the basics of magnification. Uh, just last week with a colleague, I was showing her how to change the zoom level on her magnifier. And I, I thought back to a few years ago, and I was like, man, I didn't think I could do this. When it goes to really in-depth teaching about changing colors and mouse pointers, I can show them how to do it, but to figure out what contrast works best. Mm -hmm. That's where I have a low vision colleague who is better at that. Just like when he has someone who really needs to learn the intricacies of voiceover, he sends them to me. So we mm -hmm. sort of tag team. Right. As far as accommodations, when I was working for myself, that was pretty easy because I could bake accessibility into everything I did. So when my brother and I ran our business, we developed our own uh, talking software. We called it Sales Center, which was um, a CRM, customer relationship management. So that was how we managed all of our orders and, and um, sales data. Uh, when I ran the retail store, of course, I had sighted employees, and so that was a little different. Again, I could still bake accessibility in from the ground up, which was awesome because I owned the business, and so I could make the acquisition decisions about which products we bought, um, <clears throat> but I had to do the extra work in determining what would work. And so at that time, we picked a system called Retail Pro, and I just called up the vendor and I said, hey, before I spend this you know, $2,000 to buy this software, can you please install JAWS and let me hear what it sounds like on the phone so that I know this will work for me? Because even though my sighted staff will be using it, I want to be able to run reports and do it too. Mm -hmm. And so when I just made that a standard question as part of the sales um, process, she was like, sure, no problem. And 10 minutes later, she had Jaws talking and she's like, I can't understand what it's saying. And I was like, oh, I can, it works great, thank you. And <laughs> so it worked good. So I think if you're just open and upfront and honest with people, generally they're pretty um, happy to cooperate, I find. Wow, that's such a great idea because I mean, we're <clears throat> always asking the question, is it accessible? And the software provider always says, I don't know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so like having them install JAWS as a demo and just try it, that's a great idea. I think it just comes down to knowing what questions to ask, mm -hmm. you know, and if they, and not just the yes or no questions, but the open-ended ones, hey, can, can you do this and let me hear this? Because if you, I, I never like to just complain and, and bring a complaint to somebody without a solution, because then it's just a complaint. But if I bring a problem and say, hey, this is how we could solve it, then it gives them an out to, to cooperate. Nine times out of 10, it works pretty well, I find. I was just curious about what you said about um, if you need pretty powerful magnification that a screen reader is actually more efficient. I mean, do you, do you say that to some of your low vision clients? Do you encourage people to try the speech option over the magnification because of that learning? I do. Um, I try to say it in a very tactful way. Um, tact and diplomacy aren't my strong points, but I really do try to be kind because I understand a lot of people are visual learners. And mm -hmm. so I'll say something like this, you know, if, if you're a senior and you want to just use your computer for occasional emails, you know, having a few words on the screen is probably no big deal at a time. And if it takes you longer, that's okay. You've, you've earned the time 
um, to take more time or you've earned the right. But if you really want to be successful and go to school or have a job, it's not good enough to just be able to read slowly, slowly. You have to be able to be efficient. And so I'll encourage them to do two things. <clears throat> I'll ask them to start listening to audiobooks or podcasts to get more used to listening or learning by ear instead of um, by reading by sight. And then I'll encourage people to just try using the um, read aloud feature on Windows or the speak screen feature on iOS so that it's not a full-blown screen reader, but they can see how quickly and easily they can read an email or a web page when it's read out to them. And so a lot of times they're like, oh, wow, this actually does work. And so then they'll start using a screen reader at least some of the time and they'll slowly transition over. Awesome. What challenges have you faced related to your vision? There were a few, <clears throat> to be honest. Um, the ones that come to mind, especially when I was little, because ever since I was uh, 10 years old, I wanted to travel overseas. And I know, Sean, you've done a lot of overseas travel too. So this one you might re mm -hmm. relate to on some level. Um, but I really felt like when I was young, I wouldn't have the freedom to travel. Uh, so that was until I was a teenager. I really felt like that was a barrier. <clears throat> Self-confidence was a big one that I didn't have when I was young. And then even when I was transitioning from business into my new career, again, my self-confidence took a big knock. And then figuring out a career path, like I said, after I sold the business, that was a challenge because um, a lot of my friends were doing, they were getting these high paying trades jobs or even some of the, the uh, entry level positions you needed, it seemed like you needed vision to do some of them. And so finding something that was the right fit uh, was a challenge. And I, I later learned that a lot more jobs are possible than I first thought. I just needed the skills and attitude to be able to tackle that. So those were my challenges, I would say. That's awesome. It, it must be interesting going from running your own business to being an employee? <laughs> it's a very good observation. And yes, it was very thrilling and very frustrating at the same time. Mm -hmm. So the thrilling part was that <clears throat> every Friday or every other Friday, I had a consistent paycheck. I didn't have to worry about you know, a dip in sales or a busy Christmas season or a really slow February and March. At the same time, it was difficult to learn that as, as part of any big organization, I'm not beating up on CNIB because I love where I work, but there's just a lot of different people that make decisions and, and there's a process and things just move way slower. I was just used mm. to talking over an idea with my brother and we would implement it that day. And, and <laughs> at any big organization, it takes weeks, months, years sometimes. And so that was an adjustment because I had never worked for myself until I, or I had never worked for someone else until I was in Louisiana and then here. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Okay. What skills do you <laughs> feel you have developed because of your visual impairment? Again, there's a few, and it kind of comes back to the challenges that I had, especially when I was younger. So problem solving is a big one. And let me tell you, this is something that employers really want. I'm sure, Sean, you've, you've seen that too. Mm -hmm. So people who can think outside the box, that's not everybody. And so I like to tell people that disabled people are some of the first life hackers, um, we solve small and large problems every single day. And so because we're used to solving problems just to figure out how to get from, you know, home to the bus stop, to the airport, to the hotel, um, when a problem presents itself in the workplace or at school, it's our natural inclination to solve it. And so I think that's, an, that's a skill or an advantage that I picked up. I'm also amazed at how many people ask me a question that they don't know the answer to and that I don't know the answer to. And yet I look like a genius because I go on to Google and I type the question into Google and I read them back the answer. <laughs> and <laughs> Google makes me look so much smarter than I am because I think often as blind people, we're used to just researching. 
And so that's a valuable skill that, that you can bring to the workplace and, and that I can bring because I'm used to just finding out an answer. If someone, if someone tells me no, I rarely take that at face value because I've been told no all my life. And so I just want to, that just encourages me to find a different path. And so that's, a, that's something I learned. Critical thinking, I think, would be the next one. Um, so coming up with innovative ideas uh, before it was um, doing research and development. So inventing different products, finding different ways to bring them to market, mar different marketing strategies, et cetera. Um, I think it's important to note that many inventions created for blind people are now used by everyone or for disabled people are now used by everyone. So those curb cuts were created for people in wheelchairs originally, but now a mom pulling a stroller or any travelers with a, with a rollerboard suitcase, love them. Mm -hmm. Same kind of idea with text-to-speech and dictation. That was cutting edge back in the 80s and 90s. And now my sighted friends all use Siri and Alexa. And that technology started as an adaptation created by and for blind people. And now it's mainstream. And so that's something else pretty cool that a lot of our solutions end up benefiting the world at large after. And then I think lastly, I, and it sounds funny, but I would say sense of humor. So I've had to learn to laugh at myself, especially when I make some silly mistake, um, which happens to all of us, but admittedly, it can happen more as someone without vision. So I've had to get comfortable in my own skin um, because when I'm comfortable and I convey that to other people, then they feel comfortable around me. So that's been really important to me because I want people to feel at ease when I'm teaching them something new. I love the disabled people or the first life hackers. That's, <laughs> that's, I, I might have to steal that and, and quote you because that's Go right awesome. Ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Okay. What do you love most about your job? There's a lot of things. <clears throat> I love playing a, a small part in giving others greater independence, I guess, especially in my role through technology. I love taking I can'ts into I can'ts. I love showing people that technology is a great equalizer or it levels the playing field. And so if somebody comes to me and says, I lost my vision, I can't dial the telephone, I can't read the newspaper. I'm like, oh, yes, you can. You just have to use this tech. And so when I encounter somebody at the beginning of their vision loss journey and they're really struggling and then I can show them and my team can show them different strategies to do the same things and they send an email and they're like I just did my first online grocery order that makes all the frustrations worthwhile yeah. um, I'm sure you've seen that too mm -hmm. and so then seeing clients settle on a goal and then chasing after it kind of related, but that's really rewarding. So I love seeing other people succeed because then I know I'm doing my job uh, well and I want to do it well enough so that those people don't need me and we can go on to new people. And then I have to say, I mean, we all sort of long for this sense of belonging and collaboration. I love working with colleagues, especially if we're working on a shared document and we're all making suggestions and we're editing over Zoom and we're all tossing ideas around and saying no to some and yes to others. It's just, it's fun. You feel like you're part of something bigger than yourself. So that's really cool. And then the last one, I suppose, would be in past roles, especially when I ran the Braille Superstore, I got to do a lot of international travel, which I absolutely loved. I was privileged to go to about two dozen countries uh, for work and leisure into all the continents except Antarctica. It is on my list. So that I really love exploring new cultures and meeting new people. Okay, let's talk disclosure. Now, I know at CNIB, it's not, it's actually an <laughs> asset when you tell people yeah. that you're blind. But when you were running your business, especially the, the non-blindness related one, did how did you deal with you know, people you were dealing with, customers, did, would you tell them you were blind? Did you need to tell them? Like, how did you handle the whole disclosure thing? Yeah, you're absolutely right. For CNIB, they actually consider blindness an asset. No big surprise. That was pretty self-explanatory. For the Braille Superstore, same kind of thing. People actually love knowing that 
-hmm. the person who designed the product and is selling the product also uses the product. For the gift shop and the clothing store, it was, I still did tell everybody, but they would shake their heads, especially because the stores I had, one was a gift shop that um, men and women shopped at, but next door to it was a women's clothing store. And I have no sense of fashion. (laughs) (laughs) I would just, I would laugh and joke with customers and, and tell them, you know, I do all the buying, I pay the bills, but as far as telling you how something looks on you, I'm going to go get somebody who knows. And so I would just make a joke of it and put people at ease in that sense. So I've always been pretty open about my blindness, um, but I'm honest about what I can or can't do. I think some of the funniest ones was when I would go on uh, buying trips in Vancouver and Toronto or Chicago, uh, especially for the clothing, because people just shake their head. Like I was coming in with obviously a sighted person and they were like, why is he here? And then when they realized I'm the one with the credit card, they're like, oh, okay. But all the fashions and <laughs> styles made no sense to me. <laughs> so. Why did you pick that as a business? That's really interesting. I didn't pick the clothing store. I picked the gift shop, because, okay. but they came as the package. Mm. I picked, the, I picked um, the retail gift shop because after I sold the Braille store, there was a non-compete clause for a couple of years. So I couldn't work oh. in that industry. Right. And so I had to do something else. And I thought, well, I, I'll still like selling something else. And I did, but I really missed working in my industry. So that's why when the non-compete was up, I sort of came back to my roots, but in a different way in teaching instead of in, in business. Interesting. Okay. What did your parents do that really helped you be successful in your career? <laughs> This is a good one. And for any of you uh, young people who might have parents who you feel are annoying, maybe pay attention to this because I found my parents annoying at the time. And yet now I'm really grateful for several things they did. So the first one and the main one was they treated me like a normal, ordinary kid. They never allowed my disability to be an excuse. They had the same expectations of me as they did for all six of us kids. Three of us were blind, three can see. Yeah, it took, it took us uh, who didn't have vision longer to learn to do uh, some tasks uh, like cleaning thoroughly or you know, stacking firewood or um, loading tons of building supplies on and off the, the boat and walking up the docks, but they made us do it all. And so because they treated us like we were normal, capable people, we internalized the fact that we were normal, capable people. And then something else which kind of surprises me now that they let us do, when my brother and I were 15 and 16, we were just starting our business, they let us travel to Atlanta on our own to attend an NFB convention. And so we had our own hotel room. Of course, we were, there were people that, that knew we were there that were looking out for us, but that was a tremendous uh, confidence booster. Wow. Um, and then I suppose the two other things were, in my case, because I have no vision, my mom taught me Braille. Of course, she's a Braille reader herself. She insisted that I learn that and keep the skills up even after we got a talking computer and technology could have replaced it. Uh, so... And I'm really glad she did because I do a lot of speaking and presenting at my job. And I don't think I could do anywhere as near good a job without having notes in front Mm -hmm. of me. Um, And then the last thing, and this was more my dad because he's cited, is he insisted on awareness of visual cues. So even though I can't make direct eye contact with somebody, he insisted that I look towards the sound of their voice. He insisted that we know what is visually acceptable so that we don't stand out more than we need to. So those things, I'm really glad they they did and they held us to the task. And it must have been hard for them, but I'm glad they did. Oh, such a great answer, Craig. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. If you could give advice to your younger self, what would what would it be? There's a lot of things I'd tell my young self. Um, and this was actually a fun one to think on. I think the few that came to mind were competence is essential. And even though I had a lot of blindness skills, I had taken some O&M as a kid. I learned 
certainly some assistive tech. I learned Braille. Investing the time in thorough blindness training really does pay dividends. And in the States, what we have is after kids graduate high school, they often will take a gap year and go to one of these intensive uh, blindness rehab training centers. And after you do something like that, whether you're fortunate to go there or you just get a ton of training through uh, an agency or a school board here, if you do it right the first time and really pour your heart into it, getting training every day, every week, you'll find that you're set free for life. And so I never need to go back and get more O&M training. When I move, I just go explore my neighborhood. I figure it out. And so I don't have to keep going back and getting uh, training on this or that. When a new version of the iPhone comes out or iOS or Windows, I now have the problem solving skills to figure it out and Google and ask people without having to go back and get more specialty training for my whole life. With competence comes self-confidence and that is just as important. So I feel like you obtain self-confidence through accomplishing big and small wins alike. So whether you're jumping out of an airplane, which is really fun, by the way, I recommend everyone try it once, or whether you're cooking dinner for your family on your own, the more things you do that stretch you and challenge you and push you, the more, the more you'll realize, hey, if I can do that, what else can I do that I thought I couldn't do? Um, and then the very last one that I would go back and tell myself, especially after I sold the businesses and I was sort of casting about trying to figure out what to do next was when I was in a uh, rehab teaching seminar in Florida and Dr. Bell was speaking. It was an hour long presentation. I couldn't tell you to this day anything else he said except one comment. It hit me like a lightning bolt and it went something like this. You've got to believe you can do a job before anyone else will. So you have to have the confidence that you know what you're doing and you have to have the the competence to be able to properly use a computer and an iPhone and to know that you can get there on your own. And then once you feel like you can do it because you know you can, then you can convince other people. So those are the three things that I would tell my younger unwise self if I could go back and do so. (laughs) That's awesome. Great advice. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Craig. I, your story is fascinating. I really appreciate you being here and sharing with us. It was really awesome to get to know your life a little bit. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Sean. I've read some of your story too. It's also very, very interesting. So it's fun to swap stories and and sort of share um, Mm -hmm. learnings with each other, isn't it? Yeah. I'd love to have you on our podcast at some point if you're open to that. Oh, I didn't know you had a podcast. Very cool. It's called Limitless. Check it out. (laughs) Oh, check it out. Good good plug. Good time there. Yes. (laughs) Awesome. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us for exploring work with.